if you have your Bibles tonight, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. This evening, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, one verse tonight says it all in my book. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 tells us, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Noah Webster, in an American dictionary, describes liberty as being that which is a state of being free from bondage. Liberty. We mentioned on Sunday, and in some ways this message segues and dovetails into Sunday's message, we talked about liberty and we talked about the expense and the cost of it, and that it is something that God has sent to us. The Bible tells us, and it has told us for thousands of years, that God has put this desire within us to pursue liberty, that our God is a God of liberty. He wants you, he wants us to be liberated. And when Noah Webster, the great Christian and statesman of our revolutionary period, wrote in that American dictionary, you can look at it later, he made mention of the liberty that drives the human heart to seek freedom. What we need to understand tonight is liberty is something that demands our management of it. It is an awesome and tremendous privilege that God has granted Someone has said that liberty can only exist if it is faithfully defended by vigilance while at the same time being perpetuated to the next generation. And isn't that true today? We've got people today, and maybe, I don't know, I would assume tonight if you're out here that you are a lover of liberty, but there are those in our culture today, they enjoy all the fruits and benefits of liberty, but they don't know how it was bought, how it's maintained, and they're not even thinking about Defending that liberty in the future because they think it's just something that is entitled to every human being. And yet, it's promised by God, but we would all agree tonight that it's something that is blood-bought. Many of you have given your effort and your time and your blood to be part of that military power of America that you have defended our liberties and our freedoms. And for that, we are so grateful. As the fife and drum core was playing a moment ago. That sound, I don't know how familiar you are with that sound, but if you've read a lot of books on the revolutionary period, that is the exact sound that John Adams would have heard and listened to. It's exactly what General Washington would have commissioned to communicate. Listen, he used those fife and drums to not only communicate information, that's how they text in those days, that's how they sent a message. That's how they called someone across the battlefield. The fife and drum would communicate through a rhythm or through notes or through keys or whatever they used in that musical delivery. Information, advance, retreat. Messages were sent. And to think tonight of those young people playing that in uniform, authentically so, that 237 years ago, our nation's founding fathers, that was a sound to them that would have put goosebumps on their arms or on their back, and it would have put a lump in their throats, because to them, that was the sound of liberty. And we need to teach that. We need to remember that. We need to be instructing our children. So tonight, as we talk about something that, in my opinion, as you look at what God has done in the United States... God has done this, as I say. It's against all odds. There is no way that America should have won the war. You know, we lost more battles and yet won the war. When you look at the picture and the story of America, you're looking at a modern-day version of what God did with the nation of Israel. It is awesome to realize that and study that. And so tonight, I want to invite you to put on your garments, as it were, of a revolutionary spirit. This is something that the world looks to us to maintain. Do you know that? Do you understand that? The world looks to us. When there's an uprising in a nation somewhere in the world, they look to the United States to come to the aid and to the support of people looking for freedom. They expect the United States to come alongside and defend an effort to be free. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, church, family, as we sit here tonight in safety and in peace and in freedom and in liberty, did you see the news today? Less or at about a year, Egypt, under the rule and reign and the tyranny of the Muslim Brotherhood, their constitution lasted just a year. 
and now it's been dissolved today. And the people have overthrown the Muslim Brotherhood, and they're seeking freedom, and they want to have the freedoms that we have tonight, and that is an awesome thing. Some people are saying on the news tonight that it just may may very well be right now taking place in Egypt, the largest gathering of humans ever in a protest in human history. Nearly 4 million people have gathered together asking for a government that will give them freedom. And I think that, as I said earlier, that's something in the human heart. As Americans, we need to always nurture that revolutionary spirit that we are a people born out of freedom. Don't settle for anything less than that because our God is a God of liberty. He's a God of freedom. Jesus sets us free. He died on that cross to set us free. Jesus rose again from the grave to set us free. Our God is a God of liberty. And no matter who you might be in the world, it is awesome to realize that you could be in prison tonight and yet God can begin his work of liberty in your heart and set you free. I want to recount some history tonight. I quote, how did Great Britain, the most powerful nation in the world, find itself defeated by a continental army? An army of farmers and young boys that was unmanned, undermanned, understaffed, poorly led, woefully equipped. What was it that transpired in the year 1776 into a foundational period that would give birth to the most powerful, wealthiest, and influential nation in world history? What was it that turned a scattered people into a united nation that would grow up to turn into a beacon of liberty for the world? Simple beginnings, it is said, that the Continental Army was so low in ammunition in 1776 and men that the effort seemed to fight one to be impossible. They had been ordered not to go off half-cocked and to... Not fire until you can see the whites of their eyes, so as to make each and every precious shot count. Every morning, Washington's army would wake up at 5 a.m. and march 10 miles and only to stop for breakfast, for chapel service, and then off to war they would go. What a day, huh? What an amazing thing. By the way, I kind of like this idea. Washington had ordered that... You were not allowed to miss chapel service every day unless you were sick. You were ordered to go to church as a revolutionary soldier. I kind of like that. I'd like to have Washington come back and order you all to go to church every Sunday. Isn't that tremendous? They did it every day during that period of time. And then there was a simple return. After the war and after the victory, as our nation was getting underway... I think you know these words. We referenced them a little bit on Sunday. That it was Benjamin Franklin that issued this statement. He said, in the beginning of the contest with Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayers in this room for divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard, and they were graciously answered. All of us were engaged in a struggle, must have observed frequent instances of superintending providence in our favor. Have we now forgotten this friend? Or do we imagine we no longer need his assistance? I have lived long, sir, and a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? Said Benjamin Franklin. In the Battle of Trenton, New Jersey... On December 26th, 1776, history recounts the following. Against all odds, immediately following Washington's famous crossing of the Delaware River, General Washington marched the Continental Army to Trenton, New Jersey on Christmas night. The Army's forces included horses, guns, wagons, soldiers stretching out for nearly a mile. The weather was worse than anyone had expected. The army continued on in the freezing storm. Washington and his army had been awake now for nearly two days. And having marched for nearly 12 hours, arriving just outside Trenton, New Jersey, shortly after 8 a.m. on December 26, 1776, the Continental Army 
started its charge onto the city. Three columns marched through the thick snow with Washington personally out front and leading the charge. As the soldiers pushed forward, artillery began to fire. And at the same time, German drums urgently called the Hessians to arms. The British had hired the Hessians, Germany's elite fighting team, to assist Great Britain in the destruction of America. But to his astonishment, Washington had maintained the element of surprise. Immediately after the firing began, three Hessian regiments ran from their quarters ready to fight. Quickly forming ranks, the Hessians established a line. The American army entered the city at two points. John Stark marched into the city on River Road from the west, while Nathaniel Green and General Washington arrived from the north. In an unexplainable confusion which enveloped the Hessians, they became disoriented under fire. The Hessians could not retreat, they believed. There, their commander was shot and their officers were wounded or dead. The Hessian warriors surrendered, surrounded when news of Washington's victory at Trenton was reported in London. It changed the tide among the English who now began to concede Americans' concept and desire for independence. The battle for Long Island, New York, morning of August 27, 1776. The battle of Long Island, New York was fought. It was the first major battle in the American Revolutionary War following the United States Declaration of Independence on July 4th. The battle for New York at Long Island was the greatest battle in the entire war. And at the first battle, listen, in which Washington's army of the United States engaged the British head on, having declared itself a nation only one month earlier after the British evacuated Boston on March 17, 1776, General Washington believed that the next British attack would be next or near New York. By mid-April, Washington had marched his 19,000 soldiers down to lower Manhattan and quartered them at the streets of Wall and Broad. He then strengthened the batteries that guarded the harbor and constructed forts in North Manhattan. And on the heights of Brooklyn across from the East River on Long Island, General Washington waited throughout June for the British to appear, hoping that somehow his undisciplined troops could hold off a British attack, which he was certain would come to Manhattan. In early July, 400 British ships filled the harbor at New York with 32,000 professionally trained British soldiers led by General William Howe. All hope seemed to be fading for America's hopes of liberty and freedom. Against all odds, America lost more battles than it won. And yet, by the grace of God, won the war. If God can bring about a victory for a people crying out to him, cannot God turn things around for us? And do we not understand, as I mentioned on Sunday, it is not that we desire some utopia on earth. We are Christians. We're waiting for the Lord to come back. I see some clouds in the west. I pray that he would come back tonight for us now in the clouds of glory. But until he does come, we stand for freedom. We stand for liberty. And we think about our children and our grandchildren. We think about the future. And young people tonight think, listen, it's easy to enjoy all the benefits that we have as a free people. But understand that we enjoy and we are somewhat coasting, as it were, on the laborers and on the toil and on the suffering of those who went before us and through blood-bought freedoms won for us this liberty. It is an awesome thing to realize. Against all odds... America became a free nation, a nation for the first time in human history that declared and stated in their opening statement, we the people, that had never been heard before. It was always by kings, it was always by rulers. This is a nation of we the people. And that is something that sets us apart. Why? Because it is a God-engineered thing. It is something that God has put within the heart. This nation from the beginning has looked to the direction of God. Tonight, maybe you saw the news. I had to laugh. If you have not seen it, I'm sure it's on YouTube by now. But this weekend, or I should say this week, in our nation's heartland, I forget the name of the city. I was laughing and missed the name of the city. 
the atheist of America unveiled a granite monument to atheism. And it says, the American atheist. And on the back side, inscribed in granite, it says, this nation was not founded upon a Christian foundation. That's their statement. Think about that for a moment. If it's not true that we were not founded upon a Christian nation, then why didn't the atheist say something like, in loving support and dedication to, I don't know, Chuck Darwin, um, somebody, but in their statement, listen, when someone protests facts, that's interesting to me. Do these people not own a computer that they can search the web at least to find out what history is all about? When, when God established America, it's overwhelmingly clear. Go look at the history. But today, if we don't know history, people are grabbing onto things that make them feel better. They're saying things like, for example, God had no involvement in America. And yet history absolutely says that he did. It's overwhelmingly a fact. But people today, listen, in fact, President Harry Truman said that our post World War II struggle was not against any particular nation after World War II. You know what President Truman said? President Truman sh said that our struggle is Christianity versus non-Christianity, belief in God versus atheism. When you believe that God is not involved in the affairs of men, then you've got to conjure up other explanations. Tonight we stand as a people free because God in his mercy to this hour has kept us a free people. We need to remember that. We need to thank God for that. Against all odds, God brings freedom to those who are hungry for it. America, Christian, tonight, are we hungry enough for freedom? Are we hungry enough to study and to know that the root and the source of freedom is from God and then from that move out from it? I hope we are. The Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Two ways I want to talk to you tonight about that. As an individual, listen, Christian, God has given us the power by His Holy Spirit to not go back to the world that He delivered us from. You need to remember that. When the world comes tempting or when the flesh comes tempting us, Remember Galatians 5.1, God has given me the liberty, he's given you the liberty to stand fast and strong against the temptations of the world that God brought us out of. We don't have to go back to the tyranny of our flesh and we don't have to yield to the temptations that war against us. We have been liberated by the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit guarantees that you and I can walk victoriously in Christ in this ever-darkening world. It doesn't matter how dark the world gets. You are the light. The other thing is this. As a nation, we need to remember that we need to be careful that we don't step back into bondage. And we need to evaluate all that as Americans tonight. Tomorrow when we celebrate the 237th birthday of our nation, as I mentioned on Sunday, northern nation. There are many older nations, but northern nation in the history of man has ever had a birthday under one constitution like we will celebrate tomorrow. What will we do as a nation? Will we once again lean back and look back and reach back to his freedoms? Will we seek him and cry out to him. We are now in the days, I believe, of a great battle culturally. It's almost easier, I would think, to battle physically some war. But America's in a battle for ideas. America's in a battle for what people would say today, liberty or freedom. And we're passing laws, and some laws are not even being passed. They're being thrust upon us without us choosing, without the normal 
constitutional means of how a law should be brought in, where we have judges that are doing things by fiat and doing things by tyranny, that they've taken it upon themselves to legislate or to create law. And when they make a decision, some people are saying, we're liberated. But let's step back and think for a moment. Are we liberated? Is that what freedom is? Is freedom and liberty the license to do whatever we feel like doing? Or is it something that we need to manage very, very wisely and very carefully? We need to stand strong and be people who care and understand and be prayerful that we are in a great cultural battle. And I, I wrote this down today thinking about this. America is known around the world, at least we used to be. I don't know what our current pulse rate is, but America was known as the great liberating nation. When America fought in the Second World War in Europe, in the Pacific, when America was done liberating, we, we went home. We came home. America could have occupied Europe and stayed there. Europe could have been America today. We came home. Whenever we fight a war or we're invited to fight a war, we come home. We're known as liberators. The greatest liberating example that you and I will ever know is what Jesus Christ does. It's what Jesus Christ can do. He's the great liberator. And I, I wrote some things down to what that means to me. It's Jesus Christ who's the greatest example as a liberator. Because for me personally, I hope for you, he's liberated our lives from us, from ourselves. I had a man come into my office today, and we just prayed together. And he just wanted to make sure that the decisions that he was pursuing were Christ-like decisions and not his own. And I told him, man, I wish everybody who filled my office had that concern. He said, I don't want to do what I want to do. I want to do what God wants me to do. Being liberated from self, being dependent upon God. Jesus Christ is the great example. He's liberated from us, our fears, our greatest fears. Are you somebody bound by fear? Then you're not trusting God. You need to trust God. Well, that's hard to do. Listen, it may be hard to do. But have you not learned by now that when you hang on to your issues of fear, you've not gained any victory over them? You've not advanced at all against them? Jesus is the one who gives you liberty over fear. The Bible says to cast all of your fear upon him because he cares for you. Jesus cares. The next thing I thought about is Jesus liberating us from pain. I don't quite understand how this works other than it being supernatural that Jesus Christ in the midst of our emotional, spiritual, physical pain. Our God shows up in the midst of pain. Our God delivers. Our God works in the midst of pain. He liberates us from pain. Jesus obviously liberates us from sin. He changes a life from the inside out. And our life of sin is changed. And we're liberated. Isn't it awesome to think, remember before we met Jesus Christ, we thought that we were doing what we chose to do, but do you remember that when we lived for ourselves, we were actually slaves to what our passions were all about. We weren't free. We had to drink, or we had to have sex, or we had to have war, or we had to have whatever is fighting, or we had to have whatever. We weren't free. And then Jesus came into our lives and set us free. And then he liberated us from death. I don't know if we often think how powerful this is. Jesus liberated us from death. We hear a lot of people today talking about death experiences and things like that. But I got to tell you, listen, as a Christian, Jesus so liber liberated us from the fear of and the pain and the tyranny of death, that as a Christian, how many of you are Christians? Raise your hand. Let me see. Not one of us will experience the true meaning of death 
as a Christian. Look, you and I, don't think for a moment, (laughs) don't think for a moment that because your heart stops beating that you've died. When the Bible talks about death, predominantly, it's talking about spiritual death, separation from God. The moment you and I die, we don't miss a beat, my friend. Our heart may stop in this world, but in the next very second, our heart is beating in the presence of God. We may be watching the lights and the people fade around us in that last moment, and the last very second that the light seems to go out, we wake up in the presence of God. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That is in something that is instant. And a Christian will never see death. Yes, there'll be a funeral for you or there'll be a memorial for you. Yes, we'll come and we'll gather and finally your family will dress up because of you and be all fancied up and stuff. A little too late, but what do you care? You're seeing Jesus face to face and they had to put on a tie. You're with him. But never let it ever be said. Here, Jack, rest in peace. I don't ever want that to happen to me. I don't ever want to rest in peace. I want to be instantaneously, as the Bible promises, seeing Jesus Christ in the moment of my departure. And you want the same thing in your life. What a great promise. Jesus liberates us from death. And then, of course, as believers, we have our sights set on heaven. We'll never see hell. You've heard this before. I heard it recently yet again. Well, that person, I believe, this man said, I, this person, I believe, they've had their hell. It's been their life on earth, and that's been their hell. That ain't hell. That's just a very, very tragic life. Jesus died to so liberate us and crush the works of Satan. Jesus absolutely liberated us from the grip of hell. And that is such great news. I wonder why we don't talk about that more often. He liberated us from hell. You say, well, it's not, it's not popular to talk about hell. Why not? You know what? We ought to write a book on hell. Right? Hell. How to escape it. That's what Jesus came for. The Bible says that hell was created for the devil and his angels. God doesn't intend any human to go there. He doesn't want any human to go there. Jesus liberated us from that. I want to begin to wrap this up by reminding you of this call to courage. It's considered one of the shortest speeches given by a politician and yet it is recorded as what might be the most powerful. You probably already figured that out which one it is. Abraham Lincoln gave this address at Gettysburg and he was looking back at a nation that had just come through the worst war that this nation so far to this hour has ever seen in the loss of life. And Lincoln said, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that the nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate... We cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, 
who struggled here have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add and to detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never be forgotten what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Father, tonight, we ask you, Lord, in Jesus' name, that as we gather, Lord, under this sky, this canopy that you have created, we come, Lord, before you in prayer and we seize these historical declarations of your intervention in our nation. Unlike any other nation outside of Israel and all of the earth throughout all history, none can boast in you, God, like we can. It is in you, Lord, we place our trust. It's in you, Lord, that we seek to cry out again tonight. It is in you, Lord, that we call upon. We pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that from this nation, from this spot, from this place, holy and passionate prayer would rise before you tonight, that tomorrow, as our nation considers its liberty and freedom, that we would remember as a country, if our government won't lead us in prayer, if our pulpits don't lead us in prayer, if our pastors don't lead us in prayer, Lord, we have you. It is you, Lord, we cry out to. It's you and you alone that is the answer. That, Father, we pray that you would, in a collective sense, hear once again the prayers that have blessed your heart since the founding of this nation. Father, we ask that as we prepare our hearts, Lord God, for the birthday of this nation once again, that we would not forget you. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.